people literally may not know that it's not okay for them to be reading astrological charts or getting their palm read. And so if we elaborate on that and teach that to people, then they can turn away from it and stop doing it. And if they're demonized from it, they can get delivered from it. Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of God is Not a Theory with Ken Fish. I'm your host, Grant Pemberton, and we're in round two, episode two of uh, the discussion uh, that we began last week on uh, new reformation uh, as opposed to new apostolic reformation. And so, uh, Ken, you and I have been talking, um, you know, quite a bit, not not so much as recently as we did uh, about a year ago. Uh, just about your feeling towards this this new reformation uh, that that you believe is coming, that's needed, that's necessary uh, here in uh, in the West, and so uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about that, answer some questions that we've been getting uh, from from listeners about uh, NAR uh, versus uh, what um, what we're talking about. NAR is New Apostolic Reformation. Uh, then, if you know, what, if you want to hear about where that came from and the history. Go listen to last week's episode uh, because I can I think you did a great job of getting getting us through that. So uh, today we're talking a little bit more about what what you're meaning and what you're going for and uh, and all of that. So why don't we just begin to to kick that off? I'm pulling up some of the uh, points here that we talked about um, at this time. But, you know, essentially we're comparing the two two things. Is that is that about right? Uh I'm sorry, comparing it to two things. What do you mean two things? We're, we're comparing this new reformation uh, to what the critics are saying about uh, NAR and really what we're going for uh, here and uh, what, what you've been pressing hard at. That's it's right. And the other just thing framing that, the conversation. Yeah. The other thing that I want to try to do is at least think about some of the um, key principles of the first great reformation, the one that Martin Luther led 500 years ago, uh, and see how those might apply in the current period. So I don't, I don't not only want to be thinking about the critics, again, I want to be thinking about what do the historic norms for church life look like? Yeah, no, that's great. That's great. So why don't, why don't we kick in here and, and let's just go through maybe a summary of, of what we talked about uh, last week and then move, uh, move forward there. Into, sure. Yeah. So I've been saying for several years that I think we need a new reformation in uh, at least the Western church. Now, there may be parts of the world where um, the church is healthier. Oddly enough, that might be places where the church is under persecution or under great pressure politically, um, for example, in China or maybe parts of Africa. Um, but when I thought, talk about the New Reformation and I think about what do we want to do, or where do we want to go, I'm really thinking about how might we uh, seek to call the church to repentance and again, new wineskins reshape the expression of Christianity as we go. Uh, Mike Bickle has famously said in multiple places that when he was in Egypt, and I, I want to say it was in the 1990s, so you know, 30 ish and more years ago, um, he had an encounter with the Lord, and the Lord said, I will in one generation change the understanding of Christianity in the earth. And I think to a very great degree, that's actually been underway and either has already happened or is happening. Because uh, when I think back to the Christianity of, of my childhood, which is more than one generation now, I have a grandson, so I'm, I'm the third of three generations at this point. But when I think back um, to those years of my youth, there were Pentecostals around, but I wouldn't say that Pentecostal Christianity was mainstream. Um, it, it became mainstream and, and along the way morphed a bit and became what we call charismatic Christianity. And for purposes of what we're doing on this podcast, it's a distinction without a meaning, but there are actually meanings. And I think both charismatics and Pentecostals would want to point those out. So I don't mean to be dismissive. I simply don't want to get bogged down in detail that keeps us from getting to where we're trying to, to go. Um, so that process, I think, has been underway. 
of changing the understanding of Christianity in the earth. Um, one thing I remember as a boy is there was a, a youth oriented singing group. Now they were older than I was, but, but I was a boy I mean, at single digits of age. And this group was called the living end. And they were somehow connected to my grandparents' church in Holland, Michigan. And I can remember the living end, particularly on Sunday nights, not so much on Sunday morning, uh, being invited to come uh, by Pastor Paul Hans, and before him, I remember what his name was, but anyway, the, the previous pastor, uh, they, he, <clears throat> he would invite the living end to come in, sing. The problem was no one was playing a piano or an organ, and we weren't singing out of hymn books. We were singing newer, upbeat songs that were a little more catchy. And, you know, when I got involved in the vineyard movement, um, John Wimber had come out of the rock music scene. He'd, he'd been uh, the main, main composer for the Righteous Brothers. And people may or may not recognize the Righteous Brothers, but they come from the early days of rock and roll, the 1960s. And among their more famous songs is You've Lost That Love and Feeling, which was featured in the movie Top Gun. Um, so when you think about John Wimber's background, it's it's not entirely surprising that the Vineyard Movement began to introduce uh, a kind of worship that felt more like a rock concert than a traditional church music uh, setting. And as time went on, uh, we began using overheads. And of course, overheads have gotten much more flashy and catchy today than they were then. But the point is the formatting of the music was different. Uh, the, the 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 rhythm of the music, the 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 language of the music was different. Now we were still singing about the Lord, but we tended to change the language to more about how we loved God and maybe how He loved us. We were still in the Vineyard Movement singing to the Lord, so in that sense, it had um, aspects of of ancient and medieval hymnody. Um, but but. We didn't tend to sing songs like Come Thou Almighty King, Help Us Thy Praise to Sing. We didn't sing that or a song that was popular in the United Kingdom. And I can still remember hearing it when I would when I went to the UK with John Wimber, a, a very popular hymn called The Son of God Goes Forth Armed for War. Nobody sings songs like that anymore. Um, our, our songs are about our relationship. God, our love for him, his love for us. Um, and if you think about what's, I guess you could say, top 40 style music these days in church life, um, even churches that are not necessarily charismatic are probably singing music that's been heavily influenced by the charismatic movement. And this would be across the board. So <clears throat> all of these things that I'm mentioning, all of these things are indicative of what we mean by changing the understanding of Christianity in a generation. But did we abandon teachings like the virgin birth, the resurrection, bodily, physical resurrection of Jesus from the grave on the third day, uh, the teaching that he died for our sins? No, we held firmly to those kinds of teachings. And to be clear, there's many more than those. I'm just trying to give a few of what are commonly called the fundamentals or key tenets of the faith. All of that was retained. So it was the packaging that changed, not the contents of the package. But that's what was going on um, coming out of really the charismatic renewal in the mainstream denominations. And that started in the 1960s. And it accelerated through the Jesus People Movement and Vineyard. Um, later, it goes on to things like Toronto. And so the music of church life today is dramatically, dramatically different from what we were singing in most American churches in the 1960s. And Grant, you're you're younger than I am, so I'm not sure if you remember hymns like this, but I know you initially come from a fairly traditional East Tennessee, uh, Pentecostal holiness kind of background. Were you singing those types of hymns or did you grow up singing these choruses and praise tunes? Yeah, we, we certainly uh, would sing the hymns. Uh, and then, you know, we were pretty affected by the Brownsville uh, music and revival. And so that started getting introduced uh, in mid nineties. But before that, it was, it was certainly, certainly the hymns. Okay. So 
in fairness to Mike Bickle, because again, sometimes people throw things out and they, they make for very catchy taglines and people latch onto them, but it's not always unpacked very well. And so what this actually means isn't always clear. And I think it's really important for anybody who's a public speaker uh, and that would certainly include any preacher of, of whatever stripe or persuasion that individual may be, uh, to define their terms and be clear that people really do know what they mean by that. So on the one hand, I would absolutely agree with Mike Bickle that the Lord has set about to change in one generation the understanding of Christianity in the earth. But on the other hand, I wouldn't agree with it because doctrinally nothing's really changed other than maybe the belief in kind of the ongoing present ministry of the Spirit um, and with it, maybe this uh, somewhat more controversial idea of modern apostles and modern prophets. But the, but the core essentials of the faith, the beliefs that have carried Christianity through millennia, none of that's up for grabs at all. Whereas the packaging is, the kind of hymns we sing, where we meet. We don't Generally, most churches nowadays that are getting off the ground anyway, they don't meet in buildings that look like churches. They meet in warehouses, in industrial space, because real estate in urban areas has gotten so expensive uh, that that nobody can really afford to do that. And also the philosophy has changed. Do we want to put, be deploying money towards buildings or do we want to be deploying money towards actually the care of people or handing out food to the poor, things like that? And so that would be another way in which the understanding of Christianity has changed in a generation. But again, in terms of the fundamental tenets of the faith, I don't think anything has changed. Right, right. But certainly how the style, praxis, contextualization, I mean, for sure. I mean, it is, it's almost like the Industrial Revolution uh, that, that took place. I mean, for so long, it it followed a pretty standard, uh, you know, course. And then all of a sudden, you know, around that time, I would say, you know, Probably, where would you guess in 60s, 50s, 60s, things really began to change? I think the shift began in the 1960s, and it really accelerated through the 1970s, uh, such that by, yeah, I, I think by the 1980s, that it was all but over, except that in a lot of the mainstream, um, what, what we used to call legacy denominations, and when I say legacy denominations, I'm thinking primarily of Protestant denominations. Uh, but but this would have been true on some level, even among the Catholics. So there was a, you know, accepted Catholic hymnody also, differed from Protestantism, but it was accepted hymnody. Um, and even in the Catholic Church, people started bringing out guitars rather than organs or pianos. But, but in the Catholic Church, we're really talking organs, primarily organs. The Protestant churches, it could have been either organs or pianos, but they were keyboards. But people started getting out guitars. And then later, guitars became ensembles where people were playing bass guitar, drums. And again, it was a bit like a rock concert, maybe not as loud. Hopefully the lyrics were a little more edifying. But the the, the feel, the tone, the vibe was, was something that anyone who had grown up listening to the Beatles or anything like that, they would feel some sort of affinity to that music. And this was actually viewed as part of the uh, effort to uh, put Christianity in front of people in a in a palatable package to put it in terms of something they already they, something they already knew and felt comfortable with, and so um, it would be we might say today it was an attempt to recontextualize the faith to the current generation. That was well underway by the nineteen seventies. And it was it was all but over in the 1980s. And so one of the places you can see this is in Calvary Chapel. They came up with a music group or division, actually. Group sounds like a band playing, but a music division within the Calvary Chapel movement. And it was called Maranatha Music, Maranatha for a Lord, quickly. But we had musicians like, I don't know, Chuck Gerard, um, Lamb, uh, the seventh chapter of Acts. I'm certainly not doing justice to this. I'm just naming a few of these bands that I remember from that era. Keith Green rose to prominence and he was a, a piano player, but he had a, he wasn't playing hymnody style music. He was playing something that was much more upbeat, um, at times almost like ragtime music. And people really took to Keith Green's music. He was a revivalist through music. 
And so again, this is changing the understanding of Christianity, not because the doctrine had changed, but because the packaging, the expression of it in the earth. And what was the word that Mike said God gave him? I will in one generation change the expression, the understanding of Christianity in the earth through that expression. And so people began to, to view the church maybe as not where you have one on every corner in an old stone building that is somehow hearkening back reminiscently to the great cathedrals of Europe. Uh, all of these churches are moving into industrial parks or much more simplified uh, buildings, uh, possibly on the edge of town. Uh, literally, when people start thinking about the Christian faith, they they aren't really thinking about what for example, my mother or father would have thought of in their own childhood or early adolescence and even early adulthood as they were growing up in America through the 19, well, 40s and 50s, we'll say that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you're, and you're saying all this to say, you know, essentially you're tying this in with the idea of a reformation and change. That's it. All of that. Right, right, right. That's right. And so on the one hand, we want to be careful about what we say. But on the other hand, I don't think we should be necessarily alarmed just because we're talking about changing how we express the faith. We're simply contextualizing. And I would just add by reference, uh, as an example, the story of Hudson Taylor. Uh, there's a quite famous book, if you're inclined missiologically, called J. Hudson Taylor, God's Man in China. And I can't remember who wrote it, but I think it was his daughter. And um, he was a British man, and he had gone to uh, China, coastal China, <clears throat> um, in the late 1800s. And he he quickly recognized that if he was going to be effective as a missionary and evangelize the Chinese, he needed to make Christianity somehow seem more Chinese, more palatable to Chinese people. Now, again, Hudson Taylor did not change the doctrines of the faith, but he began growing a long a ponytail took a while to grow it out. Why? Well, because Chinese men wore their hair in ponytails. And instead of wearing a British suit, which all of the other missionaries, but also the respectable people who were there, you know, in coastal China from, you know, Hong Kong all the way up to Shanghai, if you were a British expatriate, you dressed in a suit. You might have worn a hat. You kept a hanky in your uh, in your jacket pocket. Hudson Taylor put on the kind of white robes or black robes and wore sandals the way a Chinese man, or as they said, Chinese. So he was doing that. And he didn't do it because he was opposed to wearing suits. He did it because he was trying to say, look, if I, if I look Chinese, then maybe you'll relate to what I'm saying and you'll accept it as culturally current. And with that, we want to say that you don't need to stop being Chinese to become a Christian. That's what Hudson Taylor was trying to do. He was changing the understanding of Christianity in a generation. And whereas most of the other missionaries continued to come along with, you know, whatever success they were having, but it was rather limited. Hudson Taylor really sparked a movement. And I don't think it's an overstatement to say that today's Christian population of China, maybe 200 to 250 million believers, directly traces its descent spiritually from Hudson Taylor changing that packaging aspect so that Chinese people could say, okay, I can be authentically Chinese and still be a Christian. Right. Right. And, and, you know, here we are, we're saying, you know, essentially what, what needs to be done in the church in the West in order to reach this generation and to, to actually see the kingdom of God come because we've, we've done other uh, episodes where we've gone through the data and it's not great as far as, um, you know, the, the, the number of, of Christians in, in the country are, um, you know, staggeringly low. And, uh, you know, if you, if you want to do what you've always done, you get the same results. And so that, that's sort of been the thing that's been sparking a lot of our conversations. And, you know, here we are, we're saying, okay, how do we reach this generation and what needs to be done, you know, potentially to call the church back uh, to its, its job, because, you know, you, there's a thing called mission drift, right. And you right. can begin to, to forget about what we're actually supposed to be doing. So, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. 
So when you start engaging in this new reformation, and again, I'm not saying new apostolic reformation, we've already covered that. Now we're moving on to what I've been talking about for a while. Um, I think there's a couple of components to it. One is how do we express the faith in cultural norms and forms that people in our time can associate with very readily. Um, you know, we, we talked in the, in the session on the new apostolic reformation about the passion translation. And I said, there are some limitations to it, but you know, one of the things that people like about it is it's not King James. Uh, there was a time when the King James Bible was itself an attempt to update the scripture for at that time, the new generation, of course, the, new, the King James Bible came out in 1611. So it was culture current more than 400 years ago. Is it still culture current today? No, it's not. And many people can't even understand the Elizabethan English uh, in which it's written. So what is the passion? It's several things, but one of the things is it's an attempt to update the expression of Christianity in, in that translation <clears throat> such that people who can't understand literally cannot comprehend the these, thous, thys, um, odd phrases like, is there flavor in the slime of a purslane? People don't understand what this means. And while this thing, these things are decipherable with a dictionary, uh, they may not be inclined to take the time to do that. It's certainly not the way we speak in modern conversational English. So the passion is an attempt to update that, just as the King James was an attempt 400 years ago to update the language that was in, in the then extant translations of the Bible, which had themselves become out of date. And so we're always in the process of, of trying to update for the current period. But the other side of Reformation is to look at what may be wrong uh, in, the, in the church right now as it exists, and not even so much with an eye to what the non-believers may think or how we evangelize people, how we bring them in, but rather how do we just bring the church back to a standard of holiness, something that looks like the biblical norms of Christianity. And, and so we have both going on. Now, I've, I've spent already a few minutes, quite a few minutes, talking about this. Okay, how do we, how do we re-communicate? Christian faith in the current period, but I, I think now what we have to talk about is, okay, what's wrong? What needs to get fixed? What isn't okay? And I think there's probably more than what I'm going to give. In fact, I'm quite sure of it because Martin Luther, uh, the reformer, he famously had 95 what they called theses that he nailed to the church door in Wittenberg, Germany on October the 31st, 1517. And Luther was a doctor, he was a professor, he was also a priest, but he was looking to um, trigger a conversation. He was looking to have a debate with other professors, other people who were literate and who were um, leaders of the church and were thinking about the church of our time. Because remember, in Luther's day, it was presumed, probably wrongly, but nevertheless, it was presumed, everybody in Europe was a Christian. They'd evangelize the continent. So we aren't so much worrying about what we're saying to the non-Christians, but we are thinking about, are we actually living true to the norms of Christianity? And Luther concluded that that wasn't going on. And so he wanted to uh, post these 95 points of disputation on the church door. So no one should worry. I'm not going to post 95. I might have uh, perhaps seven or eight that I want to go through. Maybe if we kept going, we might get to 95. I don't know how interested in all that people would be. But anyway, I think these, these main ones that I'm going to throw out are alone worthy of scrutiny. But remember, if, if the church is healthy, believers, non-believers will be drawn to it. Right, absolutely. When the light is bright, all the moths and bugs come to the light. But when the light is not bright, the moths and bugs may not come to that light. And so Luther didn't use that language, but I am. But so if we understand that when Luther set about to reform the church, to clean it up, to get rid of the corruption in the church, when he did that, what he was really doing was creating a pretext for people now to turn and begin coming towards the gospel, even though they were nominally Christian. Again, it was nominal for many of them. They actually found genuine faith as they interacted with uh, the newly born Lutheran denomination 
which would go on to become Calvinists and Presbyterians and you know, later we get many other branches of Christianity. It's not really my goal this morning to sit here and recite different movements and denominations, but but that's really how that how that comes about. And that's really what I want to focus on now is how do we how do we clean up what's what's not okay. No, I think that's great. So why don't we go through uh that list? All right. So the first tenet of the new reformation then is heartfelt spirituality. And if you know the story of Martin Luther, again the monk, not the political reformer from the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Uh, when we think about Martin Luther, he was an Augustinian monk, um, and seemingly he was devout, but but by his own writings, his own admission, um, he was often plagued with guilt, um, depression, sense of inadequacy. And um, at one time he had you know, been going along a road when, when a ferocious thunderstorm came up and the thunder was you know, crashing and the lightning was lightening up and he had to throw himself into a ditch to get off the road and to get low because you know if you're if you're standing up in a lightning storm if you're the highest thing around you might be the one who gets hit by lightning and so luther had thrown himself into this ditch to escape this lightning storm and while he was in the ditch and again this is from his own hand this is what he, he says he, he did this he prayed and he said oh god spare my life if you do, I shall become a monk. And in the Middle Ages, the it was one thing to become a priest, but it was an altogether different thing to become a monk because it meant that you were now really serious about your spirituality. You were, you were going to become very focused about prayer and fasting, maybe going through the snow with bare feet to discipline the flesh and go on extended fasts. All these things were part of what it meant to be a monk. And so Luther came to a place as a result of that electrical storm of a heartfelt spirituality that he had never known. And with that, as he as he began diving into the Bible, which is really the second part of a, of a new reformation, as he began diving into the Bible, he rediscovered something that the Catholic Church wasn't teaching anymore. And that was salvation by grace through faith. And you didn't have to do works. You didn't have to go to so many masses, say so many novenas or Hail Marys in order to get into heaven or for that matter, to be forgiven of the you know sins you may have committed here in this lifetime in any given interval of time. That wasn't necessary. You believed that Jesus died for your sins. That was enough. And if you placed your faith in him, you would be forgiven. You would be born again. You would get to go to heaven. And so with that, um, the Protestant movement kicks off and I think one of the often overlooked aspects of the Protestant movement is that there were many, many, many Catholics who left Catholicism, came over to what was at that time early on called the Lutheran Church. It was led by Luther, and it followed these teachings like salvation by faith through grace. And of course, the Bible was central, not just because that message was in the Bible, but unlike the medieval Catholic Church, which read little scripture, I wouldn't say none. And certainly within the halls of the universities or some of the uh, monasteries and things like that, in those locations, people might have been reading scripture, but scripture was not widely read publicly. It wasn't, there wasn't much of it being given out, you know, in the local church when you went to mass. It was something rather that um, was really for the, the elite or the, the spiritual upper crust, the people with the education to know it. And by Luther's day, the Bible was still in Latin. Now, there had been a revision of the Bible into Latin that was completed, I believe it was in the year 380 by St. Jerome. That translation becomes known as the Vulgate from the Latin word vulgus, which means common. So it was the common translation of the Bible. And the Vulgate persisted from 380 uh, right through until Luther launches the Reformation in 517. People so literally the math on that. It's not okay for them to be reading more than twelve hundred years. Chart, that's they around all over twelve hundred and fifty years. And so if we that the Latin elaborate on the Bible that, that everybody that had, then they can the throw away from was it. by Stop Luther's doing day and actually demonized many from, centuries before they can that. Get delivered from actually it. nobody spoke Latin other than the clerical caste, the, the, the priesthood, the bishops, the cardinals, the, the pope himself, some monks, but otherwise regular folk who spoke low German or the comparable language in other countries, maybe, you know, prototypical French or something. Otherwise, the, the common people had no ability to read the Bible. 
And so what Luther did was he wanted to make Bible reading an essential part of the church service. And he drew that idea from when Paul says to Timothy, until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of scripture. And so he said, look, it's commanded in the Bible that we should be reading the Bible publicly. Why are we not doing this? And the other thing Luther did was he translated the Bible out of Latin into German. And with it, he put the language of the scripture into the common people's hands because many people couldn't even understand what was going on in the church services. And so, you know, he was trying to democratize Christianity. Well, I think there is an aspect of that that, that needs to be going on today. I think, again, there's strengths and weaknesses in it. But when we looked at the Passion Translation, one of the things Brian Simmons is trying to do is to democratize access to scripture. The thing that's different in our time from Luther's day is that there weren't really 20 versions of the Bible that you might use in lieu of um, this newly translated Greek version, or for that matter, the Vulgate, if you were in an area where they read the Vulgate. What you had was really uh, something called the, uh, the, the Tyndale Bible, uh, the Douay Bible, the Coverdale Bible. Um, but these were all just variants on an English translation. And you had a germ, an old German edition. And Luther came up with a translation that even today is in use. And it's not particularly dated because German as a language, although it's added new language, for example, due to high technology, automobiles, planes, things like that, that no one would have known about in the 1500s. The basic way German works, the basic language of describing life, and even words like, I don't know, hat and food, and the, none of this has really changed in the German language. So people can pick up a, a Luther Bible and they can get everything that's in the Bible just by reading the Luther Bible. So Luther translated the Bible into German. So when we talk about a new Reformation, we need the Bible to be in the center of things. It needs to govern the thinking of the leadership and the people. We need to use the Bible as a benchmark of what's inbounds and out of bounds, not only doctrinally, but also behaviorally. What does the Bible call for? What's normative in the Bible? Are we doing that? And if we're not, why not? And if we are doing it, but it's, you know, somehow it seems like it's being titrated down, we're going to do less and less of this. Well, then let's go back and see what the scripture has to say about it, because there may be something more in the word of God that we never really, never really understood. We never really caught up with. And so the Bible is an essential aspect of the New Reformation. And, and I would go further and say that I don't believe there's ever been a widespread move of God anywhere where the Bible was not central and where it was not being preached. And so, again, one of the other things Luther did was with the Bible, he made reading the Bible publicly in church an essential part of the Christian church service. Now, many people wouldn't have paid any attention to what they were hearing. It's like, yeah, 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 I don't believe that. Maybe they had exposure to other religious ideas on the edges of Europe or elsewhere. So you have all of these kind of additional factors to think about. But Luther, because he wasn't a man with a conceited ego, he could go low and he could embed deeply in, in the German culture. But at the same time, he could come high because he was a doctor of the church. And he could think about, okay, where does the church need to be? What does the church need to be doing? Um, and, and how do we bring that expression of authentic Christianity to life? And over and over, over, Luther came back to, it's in the scripture, it's in the scripture, it's in the scripture. Because there's an understanding that the reason God gave us a written book is so that it wouldn't change over time. As long as people faithfully copied it, it's going to be a more unchanging version of what God himself said than something that is spoken only oral. Now, we have a particular problem with oral translation, transmission, translation in Western countries, because we believe that if something isn't truly written down, and now we would say it was some sort of digital encoding to be sure there's been no breakage in the chain of custody, but we believe that oral transmission is less reliable than written transmission. It's a fundamental tenet of Western thinking. And it's because many things that have been studied, what, what was transmitted orally, they may have let it drop. They ceased being faithful to transmit it. Other times, um, maybe what they did was they, they simply forgot, and so their oral transmission wasn't quite as tight as it should be. But there have been anthropological and sociological studies done 
which unequivocally have shown that when people are faithful to the true tenets of oral transmission, it will give you as accurate of a rendering of something that was taught way back here somewhere as if it were a written document, as long as the protocols of proper oral transmission are followed. Many Westerners don't associate that um, with oral transmission, and as a result, they inherently distrust it. But actually, oral transmission doesn't need to be less reliable until it becomes less reliable. And so what God did was he chose his word to be inscripturated, and therefore people can pick it up, they can carry it to work or to school, they can read it locally. Um, and with that, we start building a, a society of people who are, I don't know what to call it, they're word-centered. That's who they are. They're word-centric people. And I believe that's part of God's intention in this period of time, that the Bible be returned to the center of church life, that the things that are taught in it become, once again, the things that are taught in all of our churches, um, that the Bible be taught faithfully, that it not be corrupted, twisted, or forced to be something that it's not all in the name, all in the name of having a, a Christianity that's somehow a little more up to date. We never want to let go of the bedrock truths of scripture, even if we seek a form or a packaging for the Christian faith that is current, that is looks like modern life. Right. And I know, you know, as we're talking about this, I mean, that's <clears throat> so, so much inherent in, in so many of your teachings uh, that, you know, from everything from, from deliverance to prophecy to whatever, there's so much uh, biblical basis for it, not not as much of like your own thoughts and opinions, because you've found that there actually is uh, merit and power and uh, and and breakthrough in adhering to the things of the scriptures that we just so regularly because honestly we're we're a biblically illiterate culture and we yes. don't why we we have more access to it and probably have more Bibles than we've ever had. Uh, we don't spend time in the word. We don't, we don't study it. And then you have culturally, you have this erosion of the confidence of scriptures and what they, what they really mean. And, and, uh, and so you're, you're seeing the, the legs getting cut out um, from under us, as far as even people questioning the validity of the texts and what, you know, the, the, the meanings that have been, you know, everyone's agreed upon for since since inception of the scriptures. Now, all of a sudden, uh, those are being picked apart and say, "Well, that's not really what it means." And uh, that's right. and so it's, it's it's eroding all of that. And so, you know, I think it's fascinating that so much. You know, even when we when we introduce uh, you to our church, you know, our, our church was uh, originally full of people that were um, curious about uh, the Holy Spirit. But from a from a cessationist background, um, and and the thing that really helped bridge that gap was your adherence and and high regard for scripture because they understood that you know everything that you're you're talking about is coming right from the text and as John Wimber said we just want to do what the text says right we just want to do what it, what the Bible says we want to believe this book and, uh, and right. do the things in it yeah no, I think it's great so this this foundational aspect of the scripture. You literally cannot overstate it because there has never been a major move of God of any kind where the Bible was not in the center of it. Well, we uh, see it in the we see it in the Old Testament, right? We see it, you know, in Nehemiah, they rediscover the law. I mean, it's it's always been a part of what the Lord is doing, is the people just remembering, oh right, there's the ways of God, you know. That's right. Josiah, the story of Josiah's uh, reform, um, found in if I have these chapters right, I think it's second Kings twenty three and twenty four. Um, it's back there in the Bible somewhere. Uh, I believe it's Second Kings twenty three and twenty four, and I think the parallel account is in Second Chronicles thirty four and thirty five. Uh, King Josiah is very late in the time of the kingdom of Judah, and about twenty five years after his death, Judah is wiped out by the Babylonians. Uh, but during his time, there was a big reformation. And uh, we need to talk about what some of the key aspects of Reformation are, but we haven't gotten there yet. But anyway, he's leading one of those. And they find a copy of the Book of the Law in the temple as they're cleaning it out. It, it appears from the way the language is 
it must have been in some side room or a storeroom somewhere and just been put away and no one had looked at it in literally decades, possibly centuries. And so what was in there was largely forgotten. Now they did have their festivals and rituals and if they were carrying those out, that would have retained some aspect of memory of what it was that the Jewish life was supposed to be about, what the temple ritual was supposed to be about. <clears throat> but, but they weren't doing it perfectly because among other things, there were idols to other gods in the temple. And so they had a temple, they were worshiping in the temple, but what were they worshiping in the temple? And what's the first commandment, the first of the 10 commandments, you will have no other gods beside me. And yet that's exactly what they were doing. Why? Because they weren't reading the book. So they find this book, they bring it to King Josiah, and as he hears what's read in it, of what will happen to the nation if they abandon God? He tears his clothes. He says, we got to make sure this is right. And so they go to a woman named Huldah. She's a prophetess who lives in a piece of the city of Jerusalem with a particular quarter of the city. <clears throat> and so they go and they find Huldah. And he sends five of his key officials. So they come to, to meet with Huldah. And as as they come to meet with her, she says to them preemptively, because she's a prophetess, she says, tell the man who sent you to me that um, the things that are written in that book will absolutely befall this city. It, it, no doubt they will happen. But tell him as well they will not happen in his lifetime because he has heeded my word. And so in a reformation, we have to go back to that grounding. And we even see this language in the, in the uh, book of Hebrews. Uh, chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And... Then in verse two, uh, it goes on, for since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared at first by the Lord and it was attested to us by those who heard, uh, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit, attributed according to his will, excuse me, distributed, not attributed, distributed according to his will. And so what this passage is doing is it's saying, hey, New Testament Christians, you're no better than the Old Testament believers uh, in old Israel. You've got to pay close attention to the word of God. And this is why the gospel gets written down. This is why Paul writes his letters. This is why we have the gospel, so that the things that Jesus said and did would not be forgotten, but that we could go back and say, this is exactly what it says. And I can remember when I was uh, first learning biblical Greek, I was at Princeton University, but I was allowed to take classes reciprocally at Princeton Theological Seminary. And, you know, they would just shovel part of my tuition money over to the seminary. So I started learning biblical Greek. And uh, I, as it worked out, and I would say quite providentially, I began studying Greek with the head of the Revised Standard Version Translation Committee. His name was Bruce Metzger. He was the head of the whole committee for the RSV Bible, which is a very good translation even to this day. I'm not so wild about the new RSV, but the, the one that, that Metzger was involved in is actually very accurate to the scriptures because he was a man of the word. And people of that ilk in that era I think they pretty firmly believe that if you want to have a true revival, a true lasting shifting of society, you better darn well have an accurate translation of the scripture that everybody reads, thinks about, and implements. And so we've got Huldah saying to Josiah, disaster is going to befall this city because you've neglected the word of God. And yet you, Josiah, you're a man who wants to reverence the word of God, so you yourself will be spared all of it. But this is what's going to go down. With, with that understanding in the background and seeing that Luther wanted to translate the Bible into German, I do think we need to have the Bible be front and center. And, and you know, I've had some really interesting experiences along the way. I've had at times um, pastors make fun of me. They do it in a good hearted way. But um, I, one of the terms that I've had thrown at me is you are content rich, which I guess is to say that I have too much packed into my messages. But what I often find is people come up to me, even in those very churches where the pastors have said to me, you're too content rich. 
the people come up to me and they say, I could hear you. I could listen to you speak for hours because you make the Bible make sense. And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying I've had people say this to me. And I think the reason I make it make sense is I understand its context. I understand the historicity. I often understand the maybe not every single story, but the stories that are involved there, um, how the text got transmitted to us, how it's historically been understood. And even the fact that we're doing a podcast like this is part of threading all of that through so that people can grab a hold of the meaning of the scripture. They don't need to memorize anything. If they just listen, they'll understand it. And I've always thought the best way to learn anything is just to understand it. You may have times when you want to memorize the very words. I'm not opposed to that. But first, I just want people to understand. <clears throat> so Luther began to uh, speak to the, uh, the people of the day in the German language. He wasn't preaching in Latin. And then he translated the Bible into German. And, and he made it available to people. And by the way, why was that possible? Because of the Gutenberg printing press, which had just been released about the time of the Reformation. And suddenly, instead of laboriously hand copying every single version of the Bible, you could lay out these plates, set the type, check to make sure it was right. And then you could print hundreds of copies of the Bible in a day by you know dipping it in ink and pressing it down on the paper. And then again, and then again, and then again. And there'd be no change in the transmission because you'd lock in that that movable type font. And after you printed whatever, 100 pages of that page, reset the type font, and now print 100 pages of the next page, and then do it again, and then do it again. And suddenly, instead of it taking months or years to get one single copy of the Bible, you might have 100 copies of the Bible in a week or two. And now you could send them out to the churches. And so when the, when the preacher would get up to read, he could actually, they were all he back then, he could read the Bible in the language of the people so they understood what the gospel was about. And out of that, many people were born again. There is something like that that we need to return to, the common widespread reading of scripture. And if if it happens to be that the sermon is too long, all right, we'll make it a little shorter. But, you know, here's a hard reality that many people don't realize. If you're going to really have a sermon with some meat, you probably can't preach too short because if you preach too short, you will necessarily be forced to edit out valuable content that helps people have context, helps people understand why do I care about this? And, you know, I, I've certainly in my own journey, <clears throat> I've visited a lot of churches along the way, Orthodox, Catholic, Pres uh, Protestant. And I, I, I would say that particularly when I was a boy, Many of the sermons I heard in certain churches, I don't, I don't want to take shots at anybody here, but in certain churches, they, they might have been 10 minutes long. There was no depth or substance there. You know, be good, don't smoke, don't cuss. The end it wasn't quite that brief, but it kind of had that feel to it. And so what, what ends up happening if we don't really preach the richness and the complexity of the word of God is we are almost of necessity reduced to moralizing. Which is to say, you know, if you do these things, you're good. If you do these things, you're bad. And 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 going back to point one, it has to be a heartfelt faith. I, I think God cares about whether we live morally. I don't think the requirement to live morally and to uh, you know, do justly, I don't think that's gone away in the New Testament period. But when we reduce the faith to don't drink, don't chew, don't go with girls who do, don't dance, uh, you know, don't, 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 don't. I can certainly remember that expression of Christianity. And I would say that that kind of uh, what might be termed legalism is part of what caused my own mother to drift from the faith in the middle part of her life. Because she just became weary of all the do's and don'ts. And um, I think there would be many listeners to this podcast who would say that they've had a similar experience. And so we, we can't detach the heartfelt spirituality from the emphasis on the Bible, because otherwise we just turn the Bible into a list of do's and don'ts rather than here's how you actually connect with God, relate with God, have relationship with God, get born again and become the kind of person who lives a life that is truly pleasing. To you. We have to have the Bible for that to occur. Otherwise, it'll all be lost. We'll have nothing 
to which we should be paying attention, as the writer to the Hebrews said. I'll tell you another couple things that people said, aside from content rich. Um, at one time, I went to a church, very well-known church, um, had a great series of meetings, had some remarkable healings there. Um, I, I held my sermons to maybe an hour at the most, and generally they were in like the 40-minute range. And I think you can actually say something in 40 minutes, even 30, but you've got to be really targeted. You can't, you can't talk about three things. You got to really just, this is the thing we're doing today. But, but I, I did that. And the pastor raved about the meetings. And he said, I have not seen meetings like this since he mentioned a famous historical figure. And um, he said, our people love this. Uh, it was so edifying and the signs and wonders. I just praise God. We can't wait to have you back. Never been invited back to that church. So um, a friend of mine who's close with me, he attends, he attends that church. So after several years, he went to the pastor and he said, hey, how come, uh, how come you've never had Ken back? And this pastor said, well, you know, Ken's pretty old school. So what do you mean? He goes, well, you know, he gets up and he reads a passage of the scripture. Uh, and then he begins to expound upon it and talk about it. And, you know, he might go 30 or 40 minutes, maybe even a little longer than that. And that's not the way modern preaching goes. What we what we do in the modern preaching movement is the first thing you do is you get up and you tell a joke or two to warm up the room. And then you have a story. And then you read one or two verses only in order to make it what we call a legal sermon. Um, and then you expound on that for not more than 15 minutes. And then you tell a closing story or a joke. And you give a couple of prophetic works and you get off the pulpit and you're done. He said, Ken didn't follow that model. And it's it's just hopelessly out of date. We can't do that. And my friend said, yeah, but you said the people loved it. And they loved hearing the word of God proclaimed and expounded. And Ken made it very practical for their lives. And he said, yeah, but we just don't follow that model anymore. So it just, it's, not the, it's not the thing that we're doing. And that's why I've never been invited back to that church. I'm still on good terms with that pastor, oddly enough. Um, periodically, we talk on the phone he, times when he's had questions about things that he might be doing in his congregation or how he should improve or what would the Holy Spirit say about this or that. He'll actually call me and talk with me. One time I was at an altogether different church and he had something kind of really like the, the stove is on fire, kind of hot. And uh, he called me and even though I was visiting another church and in the middle of ministering to them, I took two hours to have a phone call. So it's it's a weird kind of a mix, but it, it shows you really in very large letters the de-emphasis of scripture in our modern time. And I know it may not be what we think of as up to date because we've become so attuned to the seeker sensitive model. But I assure you, people actually want to hear the word of God. They want to know truth from, from error. They want to know what does God think so that they can please him and walk with him and develop relationship. Now, does every single person want that? No, of course not. There are always people who are reprobate, who are hard of heart, um, who are determined to go their own way and defy God in any way they, they feel like. Absolutely, that can go on. But I would say for the vast majority of the people, and certainly it was true in that church I just described, um, they loved what was going on. And even now, from time to time, if I go to conferences or I'm leading a conference, depends if I'm just showing up as an attendee or I'm a speaker, um, sometimes I'll walk in and someone will say, man, I was at those meetings you did at XYZ Church back, you know, a decade or more ago. When are you coming back to our church? I can't wait for you to come back. So I, I don't agree with this line of thinking at all. We need more Bible, not less. Now, it needs to be relevant Bible. We better not be reading it in King James or worse, the Vulgate, you know, some of the Latin Bible. No one's going to understand that. And, and the part of the job of a preacher is to make the scriptures come alive and to show people this is how it applies to your life. This is why you care. And if you will live according to these things, you will thrive and prosper. And believe me, that promise is given more than once, said different ways, but more than once in scripture. So. That's what I think we need to be doing. And what that means, of course, back to this heartfelt spirituality, but also it means we need some training. We need to train people how to handle the word of God well, how to divide it rightly is the language that we see in scripture itself. 
and and with that to make it applicable to the hearts of the people because with that they will start remembering things they've forgotten they will learn things they never even knew about how they should be living and suddenly the blessing of god will come down because they're ordering their paths according to righteousness and in all of that they'll say man this thing of following god this is the best thing i ever came across yeah no absolutely now i'm going to put you on the spot grant you're a pastor you've been a pastor of more than one church is that your experience to people when the word of God is proclaimed faithfully and in, I wouldn't say overwhelming quantity, but in sufficient quantity that you've actually proven that what you're saying is really what God said. Do people respond favorably to that? Oh man. Yeah. It, it makes a huge difference. And because of what you're saying is people are so hungry for, for something that's real and, uh, and that's, that's true. And um, I don't think they want to be entertained anymore. I don't think they, they can get that anywhere at any time now, you know what I mean? And so, um, yeah, if you're, if you're preaching the word and you're, and you're unpacking it and you're helping people understand what's going on, I mean, we've, we've seen tremendous growth just from series do, doing different series, uh, take walking through the scripture and just people are just so hungry, uh, for that. So yeah, Absolutely. And, you know, one of the things that happens is um, I, I think there are there are kind of the big bucket items. And then there's stuff that may seem little uh, and perhaps not worthy of serious consideration that are often, I would say, glossed over or ignored deliberately. We could put a bunch of things on that list, but I, I don't want to get into that right now. I'll just leave it there. Um Many times preachers don't want to preach that stuff because they're afraid it will offend people. They're afraid that they will leave the church. Uh, but what I have found is that people are drawn when they are told, look, here's what God said in his word. And even if it runs counter to the culture in which we live, it nevertheless remains true. Let's pick something. I mean, I, I think we all know what some of the common hobby horses and whipping posts could be, but let's pick one that maybe you isn't talked about as much. Right now, there's a gigantic upsurge in Satanism and witchcraft in Western civilization. Um, in fact, TikTok, the app, has a sub part of the app called Witch Talk. And in Witch Talk, you can learn about spells and how to cast them and how to do various forms of whatever. Well, the scriptures are very clear that we're not to engage in any kind of witchcraft, necromancy, spiritualism, communing with the dead, augury, divining, omens, anything like that is not to be uh, done. And there are numerous passages in the scripture that address all of this. When was the last time you heard somebody actually preach a sermon on these things? And yet um, people are doing them. Why? Well, because it's become part of the wider culture. And, and it's often the case if I'll do a sermon on something like that. And it, by the way, it's not the only thing I talk about. You would know that, but some listeners wouldn't. So it's not like I've got a hobby horse. I always get on it and start beating. But on that specific topic, which is an underpreached area, people literally may not know that it's not okay for them to be reading astrological charts or getting their palm read. And so if we elaborate on that and teach that to people, then they can turn away from it and stop doing it. And if they're demonized from it, they can get delivered from it. And this is such a problem, by the way. On this exact issue, I remember preaching at a, at a, a, re, a renewed, spirit-filled, mainline denominational church in Southern California. This would probably be maybe six or seven years ago. And they'd asked me to come in and address their leadership team, their elders. Um, and so I think these meetings were in the range of 30 people. And it was a very unusual situation because the, the, the leader's team they were very close with one another. They were unusually transparent in disclosing with each other. You don't always find that with church leadership teams because they're too busy guarding their lives and not wanting to be too vulnerable because sometimes churches are not all that loving. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm speaking to this group of perhaps it was 30 leaders. Maybe it was 40, but but you get the sense here. It's, it's not a very large meeting. And um, there's a woman sitting right down here as I'm in the pulpit. She's on the right side. And a pulpit actually gives the wrong connotation also. They had a podium there for me to 
hang my Bible on and my boots on. But, but it wasn't really a pulpit. And we were meeting in just a side room of a classroom of this church. But the pastor was there, the senior pastor, and his wife was there. And I think the associate pastor was there and all these leaders. And um, somehow we got onto this topic of things like fortune telling and palm reading and whatnot. And here's this woman just to my right as I'm facing the room. So she's actually technically on the left side of the room. And um, she puts up her hand and she goes, I, I need to confess something. I have a confession. Of okay, go ahead. I'm thinking it's going to be some relatively minor thing. And she says, you know, I have been an elder in this church. And I think from memory, I think she said for 30 years. But it was, it was a long time, multiple decades. I have been an elder in this church. And then she says, just down the street over there, less than a mile away, um, there is one of these fortune tellers. She said, there is not a week in all the years that I have been an elder that I have not gone to the fortune teller to have my palm read, to have tarot cards read um, in order to learn about what was coming in my future from this fortune teller. And I need to repent of this because I'm an elder in this church. I should be a spiritual leader. And I've been doing wrong for all these years. Now, think about this for a second. If it's if 30 years is the right span of time, and, and again, it might have been 20, but it, but it was a long period of time. Let's just go with the 30. If she was going every single week, that's more than 1,500 visits over a 30-year period to somebody who's practicing the black arts. And do you know why this never came up? Because no one had ever preached in the, in the from the pulpit in that church about why these things are wrong and are not acceptable. And there would be some pastors to, in today's world who would say, I don't want to preach on that. That's divisive, and it might drive people away. People can find their spirituality anywhere they want. As long as they accept Jesus and confess him so they go to heaven, then it's okay for them to be doing it. And the answer to that statement is, no, it is not okay. And so the spirit of God hit this woman like a, like a train, like, oh, she fell on the floor manifesting demons. And we had a right there. I mean, that was the end of the sermon. That was the end of the conversation. It was the end of the discussion. We had about a two hour deliverance on that woman, driving all those demons out of her that she had picked up doing those actions. And that would have never come to light, but for the fact that we were exploring some parts of the word of God that had not been explored. Friends, you're listening to a podcast. I really mean this. We need to be preaching the whole counsel of the word. And if it's not palatable, that doesn't mean it's wrong. Every single thing that God commands us, he does because he loves us. He cares about us. He wants our best. And so it may not be what you think of as your best. It may not be your best idea of how to live. But I assure you, God knows more than you do. And with that, you should you should joyfully embrace the things that the Lord speaks of. And is this not, for those of you who have read the Psalms, is this not exactly what the entire 119th Psalm is about? I run in the paths of your commands. You have set my heart free. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So we must return to the, the word of God as part of a new reformation. And yet we live in a day in which the standard accepted sermon is one or two verses. Right. No, it's, it's crucial. Uh, there's no doubt about it. And so uh, we we're probably to a point Ken here as we're, we're at the hour mark. Um, <laughs> to, we did great getting through these points, didn't we? Yeah. So we're, <laughs> I'm just looking at, uh, we we're, we're on point two and uh, we've got at least, five or six more to go, but I think this is such a crucial component. It's a foundational component right. um, of everything that we're talking about here. And, uh, and so I think it, it's, I think it's worth spending this time uh, talking about because it's, it happens in my experience quite a bit is pe people, they don't, you know, they suffer, right. And they perish for a lack of, a lack of knowledge and there's there's a, a an extreme lack of of knowledge of what the scriptures say 
but at the same time, man, I, the people are hungry. I was, I was a, around a fire at a party on Saturday and we were, it was actually a couple pastors um, were hanging out and we were telling stories and someone else was there and, and they just couldn't help themselves. They said, tell me, tell me what you guys are talking about. You know, tell, tell me, tell me what you mean by this. Why, how did you know that was demonic? How did you, whatever. And they, they just, they said, you know, I've just been so, um, what did he say? Shocked at, at how little he knows is what he said. And, uh, and so you can, it's just, it's everywhere. People, um, you know, as the times are, are changing, uh, people need real authentic, uh, Christianity. They need to know, um, what's going on and the tools for that. So I, I think this is worthwhile of taking this, this whole episode to talk about that. Um, why don't, as we, um, probably land this plane and it sounds like we're, we're now going to do a three-parter here Yeah, as, that's as, we, right. <laughs> as we get into that, can you, can you give some, uh, for those that are listening and, and maybe there's conviction and maybe there's, uh, you know, just, Hey, I'd like to get more knowledge about the scripture. Can you give a couple of, uh, of paths that folks can go to? I know that, uh, you, they can get it from a lot of your teaching because you do, uh, you know, reference the scriptures quite a bit and, and do a, a great job at unpacking that. Um, I know that you've got some, some courses, uh, on, uh, Orbis School of Ministry. Um, are there courses that are are tailored for this kind of thing, or is it just more woven in uh, to all of the different subjects? In our school at the moment, it's woven in, but I do contemplate um, having a class. We won't film it this year, 2024, uh, but we might film it next year in 25. I do contemplate having a class on biblical interpretation and uh, now you know, there's obviously various layers of that. You could go really deep or, but, but look, we're so shallow at this point, anything is better than nothing. So we will have a class that will help people get started on that. Um, there are some uh, books that people could get that might help them. Uh, one of my favorite ones is a book by Mortimer Adler called How to Read a Book. And what it does is it teaches you how to pick up any book and read it to gain maximum impact from it. And of course, these very principles could be applied to the scripture. And so uh, it was actually a textbook we used when I was in seminary on how to read and understand things. But, but I think Adler was a Christian, but I don't think that book is specifically a Christian book, but it would be very helpful. Um, I think the other thing that would help a lot of people is if they would go buy study Bible um, and begin looking at that, because a study Bible will often have notes in it that will explain certain words or historical customs or things from the times, which people may not be aware of, desensitized to it. It's not their era. It's some of these passages in scripture, 3,500 years old, written in Hebrew, and here we are speaking English in 21st century America. I mean, things are so different that it, it's not that the human condition has changed. That's why the Bible is a timeless book. It's rather that when you read something, you could easily misunderstand what does it mean. That's why earlier in, in this podcast, I took so long explaining what does it mean to say I will in one generation change the understanding of Christianity in the earth. I don't want anyone to take away from that that we're trying to change the doctrines of the faith, but the way we express that culturally, that might change. So that's the type of unpacking that you get. And the absolute go-to, hands down, best study Bible in the world is the ESV study Bible, English Standard Version. I'm aware that there are other study Bibles. Some of them are actually quite good. Um, the NIV is one of them. Uh, Jack Hayford has the Spirit-Filled Study Bible. It's not too bad. I like it pretty well. Um, uh, Charles Caldwell Ryrie, for those who are dispensationalists, he has a study Bible. But I think the most uh, balanced and even treatment um, with good historical understanding and not necessarily putting you in a box as cessationist, continuationist, whatever, uh, and, and that you know, you can you can access it fairly cheaply by whether buying a copy online and reading it in digital form or buying. You don't need a leather bound one. Those are nice. I have one that's leather bound, but but you could get one that's a hardback. And I think you maybe pay 20, 25 bucks for it. 
um, it will have all of those study notes for you. And the only thing I want to say about study Bibles, and it's always a caution, is the text of the notes is not the text of the Bible. They sit side by side on the same page. But the one you really pay attention to is the words of scripture. The notes simply help you understand. And depending on who wrote the notes and what's going on, there's always some possibility that someone's either under-interpreting, over-interpreting, or even twisting what's said. I don't see a lot of that in the ESV study Bible. It's one of the reasons I'm recommending it. But, uh, but in some cases, that might go on. And so we always pay first attention to the actual text of Scripture, and we wrestle with what it's saying. Uh, but there's, there's even a, a rubric, a way of going about that. That's the type of thing that I'll teach when we do offer a class on biblical interpretation in the Orbis School of Ministry. That's great. That's great. Well, I think I think this is a good place to end here. And um, and so we'll pick this up again. So uh, stay tuned. We're, we're now entering and you're going to have part three, episode three of this topic. And if I know us, maybe even a fourth. But um, we'll... Uh, We'll we'll take the time because as we're as we're framing this year and what we're going to be talking about, I do think this is so important um, because this is an important year. It's an important time, and uh, and I think this is the question that are on people's minds and hearts. So I think it's worth taking this time uh, to to dive into. So Ken, thank you uh, for for taking such a time uh, to do this for for taking the time uh, to unpack things and uh, and to help us all. Uh, be able to understand. I, I I concur with all of the things that you've said. Other people have said. I've heard those uh, a lot about you, and uh, I we're so thankful that you're here and that you're uh, a voice in the body of Christ that we can we can lean on and uh, can help do that. So thanks for taking time. I know you're busy, and um, but this is so helpful to myself and, and I know to all of all of the listeners. So thank you, and uh, we look forward to seeing you all right back here next week for another episode of God is not a theory with Ken Fish.